So I just see the question. Yes, this will be uh, recorded and we will make it available on the YouTube channel. I hope this helps you guys. All right, so uh, Molly, thank you. And let's get started, please. Um, if you would move forward, thank you. All right, so good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Welcome to the Society of Arts and Crafts. Thank you for joining us for Mix and Mingle today. We will be talking about non-traditional materials and jewelry, and this is going to be a lot of fun. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is Brigitte Martin. I'm the Executive Director of the SAC, and I will be moderating the event tonight. Um, I look much forward to having a great evening with all of our guests. Molly, would you forward this? Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the other one, please. Thank you. And working with me tonight is Molly Burrow, who's our administrative assistant. Molly will help to run things smoothly behind the scenes and will watch the chat room to answer any questions you may have. Um, a quick word about the Society of Arts and Crafts. We are, in fact, America's oldest craft nonprofit. We were founded in 1897. And as you can see here tonight, we're still going strong. In fact, we will celebrate our 125th anniversary next year. One of the reasons we're here tonight is our mission. Our nonprofit aims to support and celebrate craft makers and their creativity. We consciously focus on the maker story, bringing it front and center. Our ultimate goal is to bring about a richer understanding of who we are as a culture and society, and we accomplish that through the lens of craft. Our vision is to build and sustain a vibrant community to shape the future of craft. And tonight, I want to thank you for being a part of this wonderful community. What we're presenting tonight is a Craft Boston program, and we are indebted to our Craft Boston sponsors and program partners. A big thank you at this point to the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the HIM Investment Group, and the Society of North American Goldsmiths. Thank you for supporting our efforts. And speaking of support, I would be a bad ED if I didn't bring this to your attention. Of course, you too can become a supporting partner tonight and we make it easy for you. If you would like to text the words for craft to the phone number 44321, that's for craft, text it to 44321 and it doesn't matter if it's lower or uppercase, a secure link will pop up on your phone and you can make a donation. It would help us bring you more programs like the one you are visiting and experiencing here tonight. And I thank you for your support. In a little while, Molly will also put that information in the chat room, so you don't have to write it down now. It'll be available a little later. And now I would like to introduce our speaking guests tonight. And I'm going to start with the two roses. The Two Roses are a California-based design studio and a collaboration between Corliss Rose and John Lemieux Rose. Together, they create a wide range of one-of-a-kind and limited edition adornments and art objects. And we will see a few images of their work. The studio is well known for its use of highly unorthodox materials and their designs are sold in 42 countries across the globe. They even invented an entirely new material they call core light and we will hear more about that tonight. Next up is Chinanshu Sharma who works under her studio name Parisha Jewelry. Chinanshu studied jewelry making at the Indian Institute of Gems and Jewelry in Jaipur. She creates jewelry from recycled materials, found objects, yarns, natural fibers, including various grasses and banana fibers, metals, stones, recycled denim, as well as 
recycled car and bicycle parts. Fun fact, she's actually an ex-banker and ran a small scale for-profit jewelry business in India, employing economically weaker women. Chinanshu is joining us from San Diego tonight. Next one. From a studio tucked into the back of a rambling garden in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Jessica de Gruyter works with traditional jewelry making tools and techniques, crafting modern day curiosity cabinets, which are meant to hold space for memories. Her grandmother's acetylene torch and chasing stamps inspire her work every day, much as the lovely found objects that distinguish it. Jessica is a self-taught and self-guided artist who comes to her art through workshops, books, and most importantly, experimentation with, as you can see here, beautiful and unusual materials. Rounding out tonight's group of creative individuals is Emiko Oi. Emiko is a Japanese American artist based in San Francisco. Lots of California artists here tonight. Her bold jewelry is made from repurposed Lego, and it has been shown in over 100 exhibitions worldwide and can be found in permanent collections at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the Racine Art Museum in Wisconsin. But here's the best part. Lego system in Denmark endorsed her as an influencer for young makers, and I am looking forward to finding out more about that tonight. There's a lot to talk about, so I'm ending the introductions here. But before we jump into the conversation, I'm turning the screen over to Molly for a quick moment. She will give us all a few brief points about Zoom and how we can all participate and have a good time tonight. Here's Molly. All right, thank you, Brigida. Hi, everyone. Um, I've stopped sharing, so you should be able to see a few more of our participants here tonight. Everyone is muted upon entry to this Zoom meeting, and we're hoping that you'll all stay muted until the very end when we might have a little bit of time for a live Q&A, sort of depending on, depending on how we progress here. But if we all stay on mute, we should have an easier time hearing our panelists and hearing Brigida as they uh, explain more about these fabulous materials that they're working with. If you have a question or you need a little bit of help with Zoom, please feel free to put any, uh, any questions in the chat and I'll get to you as soon as I possibly can. Um, and if you have a question for our panelists, like I said, we do hope to have time for a little bit of Q&A at the end. I'll be adding that text to donate code to the chat shortly and um, just feel free to flag me down if you need help later on. And back to you, Brigida. Okay, thank you, Molly. So here we are. I will begin our evening with a few questions for each of our guests just to get us rolling, but I would like everyone here to feel very, very welcome to raise their hands at any time or ask their questions in the chat room. We really want to get to your questions and uh, do that as quickly as we can. So this is gonna be a lot of fun for you and you're not just listening to me asking a bunch of questions. So I will start with one question that I will just ask every one of our uh, speakers here tonight one after the other to hear the individual responses. And I'll promise I will kick it off with a very easy one. So please don't be nervous. All right, let's imagine for a moment, we are at an in-person craft show or at a public event. A person comes to you and sees your work for the very first time. You are all working with extremely interesting and usually considered untraditional materials. Here it comes. What do people typically tell you about their first impression about your work? And what is your response? And I know John and Corliss Rose will have a great answer to that. So I'm gonna put them on the spot. And if you would please unmute yourself, uh, Corliss, and then we'll go to Chinanshu, Jessica and Emiko, if you would please all unmute yourself at this point so we can make this fluid. What do people typically tell you 
about their first impression about your work and how do you respond? John and Corliss, who's, who's gonna take that one? The, the first thing right off the bat is they ask, what is this? Um, most of the time, because we um, want to maintain an emotional and intellectual connection with, with the person viewing the work, and we want to make that accessible to them so they can identify with some parts of the work, we will incorporate some traditional materials. But the pieces are, are most often added and augmented with some of these unusual materials. So it's the familiar material that draws them in first. And then they notice something that's strange or odd and they'll go, what is this? And then that leads to the story uh, that leads to a little more dialogue and uh, um, satisfying their curiosity. I'm sure John has something to say too. Oh, that, that pretty well covered it. Uh, <laughs> no, we wanted, sorry. I want, what is, what's this Coralite stuff that your work is made out of? Is, well, I, is, that, is that the right word? <laughs> yes, yes, that's the right word. And uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, oftentimes that when we get asked, what is it? We say it's Coralite and that just gets a you know, question mark as well. And uh, uh, Coralite basically grew out of, uh, well, it's a long involved story with, but uh, we had a long uh, background in, in manufacturing and uh, that led to uh, working with a number of engineers and uh, taking a cue from uh, Jeffrey here, who's, who's joining us, uh, Jeffrey Lloyd Deaver. Uh, we've had a long, uh, history in polymer clay, and uh, that led us to developing our own material uh, because polymer clay was not uh, doing all the things that we didn't have all the working properties that we yeah. wanted. And we uh, used Coralite in our, basically in our own jewelry for about uh, eight, 10 years. And uh, we got enough what is it and uh, questions from other makers uh, and asking us to uh, uh, sell them, uh, you know, some of the product. And so about uh, five years ago, we, we started doing that. And- So is uh, it like a resin? Uh, basically, it's, mix or it's, something a, it's, like a, that? it's a- it's, a, it's fascinating stuff. It's, and it makes beautiful work, whatever it is. Yeah, it's a hybrid, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Uh, chemically, it's it's really a polyvinyl, and okay. uh, uh, we were fortunate enough to uh, uh, be involved with some some chemists in the medical field, and they just thought it was hysterical that jewelers were getting involved with these you know weird materials, and uh, they just jumped in and helped us uh, develop this stuff. So yeah, that's kind of how it came about. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you, Jessica. That was a question that I was dying to ask. So thanks, you know, for 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 asking this. And uh, I'm going to uh, go to the next person, um, Chinanshu. What do people typically tell you is their first impression about their work, and how do you respond? And so would you typically, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. Okay. So typically, you know, people. Uh, the reaction the same what is it that you're wearing or what is it i mean that's the question people ask but generally most of the times you know when you explain them this is you know a combination of this say pine needles and silkian they they can recognize one or two materials but then you have to give them details of the other material you know it also has this 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 and then they'll get into deeper details and you know understand it yeah, that's the reaction people give. <laughs> that's wonderful. Well, thank you. Jessica, how about you? People generally notice that I am using insect wings, flowers, um, the things that are familiar, but when they're taken out of context, they become sort of abstract. Um, people wonder if they're real, oftentimes, and they are. Um, and then they wonder how I get them. Um, I find them. 
you know, on the sidewalk, or I have little cousins on task that find them on the sidewalk, perhaps. Um, it's, it's fun. It's amazing what's out there when you know what to look for when you are looking for it. Very good. Thank you. And Emiko. So it depends on if the person asking is with a child or has a parent, because those people with kids, it's like bees to honey. They just know exactly what it is like, oh, it's a Lego. Or if they're a parent and they're um, used to stepping on them. And so they're very familiar with the material. But oftentimes um, people don't really know. Uh, it might not be as obvious. And then I'll say to them, well, by the way, this is Lego. And then all of a sudden they're like, no way. And then they get even more interested. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And I'm going to stay with you for a moment because in the introduction, I mentioned that you are an influencer with Lego. So tell us about what is an influencer for Lego? That sounds so amazing. Well, I'm so honored um, that they're endorsing me. So I'm officially endorsed by Lego. Um, they've, we found out each other about, they found out about me almost by accident. Um, we were having dinner at a restaurant in LA after the opening, um, of Lewis Boardman's collection at, uh, Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And we were having dinner next to two, uh, people from the Lego corporation that were working on shooting a video in LA. And so we started a relationship and even the next day I helped outfit the girl rock band with my Lego jewelry. And from there, we did some collaborations together. They flew me out uh, to Denmark to do some videos and to inspire young makers, uh, especially um, young female makers. So now I'm under the radar and sort of within the family in a sense. Yeah, what I like about that is, and it's, it's similar to another maker who also works with, works with an unusual material who's not here tonight. Um, uh, who works with with Barbie parts, you know, and, and many of you know her, um, that, uh, you know, the, the Lego business was actually smart enough to embrace you and not kind of, you know, uh, uh, hound you with a lawsuit uh, that you are misappropriating. So what a smart move on their part too, to work with you. And I think that is really um, uh, an amazing piece of marketing, you know, if, if, they, if they do it right. So so thank you for this first round. Um, and now I would like to go back into your backgrounds just a little bit and, and ask you a little bit more about when did you find your material or the materials that you are currently working with? Can you describe to our audience what specifically excites you about the materials? Because you know you could work with pretty much anything but you chose this. And I'm gonna start with Chinanshu because I see her right now. So um, what excites you about the materials that you work with, Chinachu? So um, like, I, I, like, like I mentioned, uh, that I work with a lot of materials. You know, it's just about matter of looking at things and anything that attracts me for its texture, form, object, you know, it's it, it just, I, I, just, just a little background about me. I grew up in India. So, and, and, and I traveled a lot. My dad was in the army and we traveled to a new, every new state every two and a half, three years. So we were going, uh, I was exposed to different culture, different costume. Every state would have its own costume, culture, language. The food would be different and it would be various crafts in that state. So all that, you know, when I started making jewelry, all that started coming out, you know, I wanted to play with this material, that material, you know, <laughs> and, uh, but basically at the, at the heart of all of it is sustainability. I look at, you know, um, if I'm using a material, what impact does it have on the environment, on the wearer? Does it have chemicals that reacts with the skin? Is it man-made or is it organic or is it natural? Will it decay? Why, will it bio biodegrade or will it stay on the earth forever? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so those are some of the questions I asked and it's a process, you know, it, slowly everything comes together and, you know, like, okay, now I can put it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's interesting that you bring up decay because that's actually a question that I wanted to ask Jessica specifically because she's working with 
materials found in nature. So, um, you know, uh, Jessica, in your work uh, and working with your materials, um, uh, are there any issues with uh, conservation in your work and how do you I, deal with those? I get those post that question a lot, for sure. Um, and I do have a couple of techniques to um, preserve stuff from getting eaten by little critters. Uh, I freeze stuff. Most of it's pretty primitive. So free a freezer is one of my best friends. Um, and the recycled plexiglass I work with does a lot towards preserving. Just the items are tight. Uh, it provides a little bit of weed protection, especially for things like flower petals, which tend to fade over time. Um, but butterfly wings are amazingly resilient. Uh, the color that you're seeing is generally like a structural pigmentation iridescence is structural pigmentation. Uh, so it doesn't fade in sunlight. It's the way that the scales lay on top of each other that makes that yellow or pink or blue or whatever color the wing is. Um, so they last forever. You'll often see mm, jewelry from my, the 1920s when it was really popular to put butterfly wings under plastic, draw little Beans on them. And those are still in good shape. And it's because we're looking at structural pigmentation instead of uh, what's the other regular pigmentation. <laughs> okay. Like flower petals will eventually fade, like the best of us. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's part of their beauty. But the butterfly wings never do. Okay. Well, that's. That's surprising. I really thought you would you would have more issues with natural materials. So I'm moving to uh, uh, John and Corliss Rose. What about your materials? Are there any challenges that you have experienced, especially uh, specifically with this new compound Corlite, that have surprised you or that are you know posing new difficulties? You mentioned that polymer clay didn't really fill your needs, and that's why you now have a new material, but you know, nothing's ever perfect. So what, what, are, your, what, what are your experiences ab around Corlite? And you need to unmute yourself, please, for a moment. Thank you. Yeah, yeah so uh, because we've been working a lot with uh, uh, engineered materials in, in uh, medical and science, uh, uh, industries, uh, uh, fragility and uh, things like that really weren't uh, uh, much of an issue. And uh, the uh, probably the you know the biggest challenge is, is uh, uh, just simply that, that people don't know what it is. And uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, you know what's what's good about it is that because it's engineered, uh, it's incredibly durable. I mean, it's it's damn near indestructible, and so uh, you know it's you can be buried with it. It's going to be here in two thousand years, no problem. Uh, and so uh, for a jewelry application, it's uh, uh, ideal because it, it it stands up to the normal wear and tear. Um, well, what we found too is the manufacturers that we've dealt with uh, were very giving and very knowledgeable, of course, about their product. And they would, with, with our prompting and questioning and asking, uh, just be a wealth of information for us. Uh, one of the earliest experiences that I had was with a manufacturer that did um, uh, Buna cord and uh, uh, neoprene cord. And I wanted everything to hang a certain way uh, for a necklace. I didn't want anything to be really stiff. And I got the whole nine yards of how everything was made, uh, the different grades, what I should ask for. If I'm going to go to a will call desk, here's the phrase that you use. And here's the minimum that you need to order with. So it was quite fascinating. And uh, also there's there's an interesting aspect that I personally like to 
to do with some of these high-tech materials, and that's to make them look organic. Mm -hmm. uh, we came across this um, aluminum honeycomb material that's used in building insulation. Uh, we discovered it could be carved, it could be uh, sanded and shaped, it could be powder coated, uh, and then it could be combined with a host of other different materials to just give some marvelous effects. So just the, the learning process, the focused experimentation, everything about the materials that we use kind of you know, contributes along to uh, uh, eventually what we do with it and what we create with it. Okay, wonderful. Um, I'm going to um, move back to Emiko for a moment because there was a question here in the chat room that uh, I would like to um, for you to answer in public. And the question was, um, does Lego send you product for your work? I wish they sent me more. They sent me <laughs> one bulk shipment once after our work together. And we're going to send another shipment last year, but then COVID happened, so that oh. didn't happen. But normally they do not supply me with my product, uh, my material product, yeah. Okay, so uh, Emiko, so since you are, you know, really known for Lego, uh, I, I, it's, it's almost, you know, uh, blasphemy to ask, but of course I'm going to ask anyway. Um, is there a new material that you are thinking about or something different that you would like to try? Because, you know, Lego, 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 and you're very successful and I know you will continue, but what about trying something new? <laughs> Good question, thank you. Um, I've been thinking more about combining more metal into with the Lego. So for example, I'll show and tell here. Um, this is a newer piece I've made, my Mandala series, and this is a convertible pin pendant. So I am incorporating some recycled tin, especially with the pins as backing. That comes from my history, working with Harriet Estelle Berman, um, doing tin with her all those years. Um, and then this is a cast bronze eye piece, which I am also wearing as a pendant as part of my To Be Seen series. So I, I'm thinking more about combining other materials. Um, I was even thinking of adding paint, uh, scratching in, which of course is blasphemy to like a true Lego fan to even alter the Lego any bit. Um, but yes, I have been thinking about it. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Uh, um, um, let's put this to Chinanshu. New materials for you, what are you thinking about? I'm always looking for new materials. <laughs> I'm always drawn to new materials. Yeah, and um, uh, but I, off late, I've been doing more metal because my metal skills are not that good. So I'm working on metal, and then you know, ultimately, I would like to combine metal with uh, something. Metal will be a man-made thing, and I'd like to combine it with an organic stuff. You know, a combination, a delicate balance between the two, and uh, our interdependence on both, you know, we, we as human cannot survive with or without organic or man-made materials. So my jewelry, I think, will be a combination of both. Thank you. Can, could you maybe hold up the wonderful necklace that you're wearing and tell us a little bit about that? Because there was a question in the room with a request for the artists, if it's possible to hold objects a little closer to the camera so that um, people can understand a little bit better. So, Chinacho, what are you wearing? I'm wearing a cord necklace. This is macrame inspired, but it's actually crochet. So this was cotton cord. It is hard, 100% biodegradable. <laughs> so, you know, it is cotton and uh, no dyes, nothing. Uh, if you put, it dyes. So that, that for me has been a big, big influence, you know. I like to keep things very organic, you know. <laughs> so it's actually crocheted uh, cord, which is wrapped around a rope, which is again cotton. So, and it's very light. All right, thank you. <laughs> There's another one <laughs> with a little addition. It's a bead, a wooden bead, again, wrapped with a, uh, a, a cotton cord, I mean, a yarn on it. So this is also degradable. Thank you. Jessica, how about you? We need to unmute you. There you go. I'm sorry, we need to unmute you, Jessica. Could you could you do that? Thank you. I'm, I'm yeah. pleased to repeat. Thank you. So uh, some of the new materials that I'm working with 
are uh, fine silver enamel. Um, enamel is a huge part of my work, as you may have noticed. And traditionally, you do it on copper, but you can do it on silver too. Uh, but you do have to do it on fine silver. So the place that I get my fine silver is I like to get, um, you know, bullion coins and roll them through a rolling mill. So they're already mined silver. I would, I don't know if I would call it recycled. It's upcycled. Um, it's already been made. It's already out in the world, which is kind of cool to me. I roll it through a rolling mill until it's the right thinness and then I can enamel on it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a lot different of a, an effect than enamel copper. You get, here's a, a piece that's fine silver enamel, you don't get quite the same color. Um, you can't get really good pink sometimes, especially if you're using the kind of enamel that I use, which is Thompson's enamel. Um, but you get really rich blues, um, vibrant greens. I love it. But it, uh, it's a it's a different beat than enamel over copper, which has oh, been a I, lot of fun to experiment with. Oh, I believe that. Um, the two roses. Would you happen to have a piece of core light close to you that you could hold up to the camera, possibly? There's been a request, or we can come back to it if you need to fetch it. Uh, we can certainly yeah, come back let's to it. let's go get a I'll go, I'll play yes. fetch we'll go fetch yeah. okay go fetch so I I'm gonna stay with uh, with John here uh, for the moment because I have a question that I'm just I'm just dying to ask John so when we put stats and drops together this this earring show um we saw that mixed media is the third largest self descriptor that artists have chosen right behind metals, pressures and non pressures And my question is, and that, you know, goes then to everybody, do you think that um, working in non-traditional materials is kind of a thing right now? And if so, why, in your opinion? Oh, I think it's been with us for a long time. You know, the, the you know, my background, uh, I, I was raised around uh, Native Americans and uh, uh, you know, Erie and Kickapoo mostly. And so I was brought up uh, in a tradition of uh, craft and working with, you know, found materials, uh, not, you know, it was uh, quite a few years before I, I got around to actually using traditional, uh, what we would call commercial you know, jewelry, metals, gems, things like that. And, uh, uh, but, it, you know, when I first got into uh, uh, transitioning into jewelry, I discovered like Ramona Solberg and Louise Nevelson, uh, J. Fred Wall, I mean, uh, Kiff Slemons. I mean, it, mixed media has been around for a long, long time. And in, in fact, you could you could actually go back to the Renaissance and see examples of people doing this. So, you know, what's exciting is to see how people are doing this in contemporary ways. Uh, uh, clear, clearly, Emiko has been you know hugely influential, mm -hmm. you know, in that that range and. Uh, uh, you know, th there's just so many uh, people that are, uh, uh, you know, Jeffrey Lloyd Dever has uh, been, uh, you know, leading leading the pack in, in polymer and, and uh, been around for, for a long time. So, no, it's, it's not new at all. It's just, uh, you know, just a continuation of, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it looks like Corliss is here with the, yep. Well, we well, show us some jewelry for us. Oh, the jewelry. And by the way, uh, uh, Jeffrey Lloyd Dever is in the audience. So, uh, you know, maybe you guys can wave at each other, you know, uh, later on. Um, Corliss, what do you have for us? Uh, we have one piece that's made with, with the Corlite material. Wonderful. And hopefully I can get up to... A little higher, yep. 
and a little further to your left. Yes, right there. Yeah. Can you guys all see and it? And that's a um, that's where the uh, material is actually glued to each other. So it's uh, there, there we go. Yeah. So it's multiple layers. Show the back. Mm -hmm. Show the back. And ooh, the back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very good at guide. Help, okay. Cecil, help. There okay, there we go. And the back um, actually can be screwed. We use micro screws to screw everything in. Mm -hmm. And it makes a very, very tight hold. So there's there's a lot that can be done with it. It's, uh, uh, it's very versatile material. Yeah, and you're showing the back of the brooch just um, reminded me of this wonderful book by uh, Miss Angulo, who did a whole book about the back of the brooch and mm -hmm. uh, remember and um, you know it was just it's just such a fun thing to look at how things are actually constructed and especially mm -hmm. with unusual materials and that brings out I think the nerd in a lot of us here in the audience and that includes <laughs> me um, but I'm going to ask that question you know of Chinan uh, um, um, uh, again you know uh, if from your background in India, you know, uh, I, when I think of a traditional jewelry from India, I do think of precious metals. But, uh, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about your perspective? Are there any new trends in India uh, that you have observed with regard to adding uh, non-traditional materials? And please unmute yourself because I see you are still muted. Thank you. Thanks for reminding me. I don't know when I got when I went on mute when I when I went mute. Okay, so yes, India largely uh, traditional jewelry is you say fine jewelry uh, is is big because there there has been generations of craftsmen and uh, it has been patronized by the kings and maharajas of all times and you know if you see the big uh, in ancient times too the chopards and every uh, the luxury brands were patronized by the maharaja of uh, uh, punjab ludhiana and um, those maharajas but yeah the traditional scene uh, was different but yeah now a lot of new designers are coming with uh, traditional non traditional stuff they are using crafts, the basic, because India is big on craft. There are many, many, many crafts in India. And the, the, the new jewelry trend is using those crafts. Uh, so I don't know if you know of um, uh, the bidri work, which is inlay of uh, silver in uh, in zinc, I think, black and silver. It's a beautiful work. It, you may Google it, B-I-D-R-I, bidri work. So it's an inlay work, which is traditionally made, uh, used to make vessels and all, which now designers are making rings and earrings and all those things uh, for that. And there is also, you know, a lot of uh, knotting knitting techniques, which are being used in India now. Uh, I was inspired by that because I was traveling and doing all these craft shows and I used to every time come up with new material. So the the, the jewelry that I'm showcasing right now at um, studs and uh, um, uh, drops, studs and drops, yes, <laughs> is actually one of the Kulu weaves. Kulu is from Himachal where, you know, it's a wool, which is woven on with a particular motifs and all. So I eat the bright red color of that uh, wool and the texture really caught my eye. And I'm like, okay, I need to make something from that. <laughs> so I added some chains and, you know, giving it a very tribal look. Mm -hmm. And I made it big deliberately because I wanted to show, you know, in a tribe when you're wearing a jewelry, you're trying to tell your position, your power, you know, you're trying to convey something. So I made it big, you know, if you wear it, you're like, okay, I'm making a statement now, bold, red, big earrings. <laughs> it's so, certainly yeah. very, very eye-catching. And uh, I love that you are mentioning tradition, you know, because that, that's important to all of us, no matter where they come, where we come from. But of course, you know, it's rare you know, to hear from someone who's originally from India. So I'm very grateful for you to um, to uh, talking about that. And I'm going right now from tradition a little bit into the future and back to Emiko with the following question. Um, are there 
from your observation, you know, and your being on the West Coast, you know, you see the newest and coolest, or so we think on the East Coast. Um, um, are there any new or current trends in jewelry that you are currently observing? And most of us are probably aware of uh, the, the latest thing that came out, non-fungible tokens. Um, and uh, so my question is, uh, will there be non-fungible tokens in jewelry soon uh, or are there already? Wow, well, I don't know if there are already. I wouldn't be surprised if there were. My husband and I talk about that every now and then because he's in the tech industry. So we're just trying to wrap our heads around those. Like, really? Um, <laughs> it seems mind boggling um, that, that really anyone could do that and make a ton load of money or lose it, you know? Um, in terms of jewelry trends, to be perfectly frank, I don't really pay attention to the trends. I kind of... Uh, don't do that much looking around. I feel like it might influence me in a way that um, I don't want to be influenced. So, um, but when I, I do want to speak to the non-traditional materials and how it's like really kind of ballooned a little bit more out into the mainstream, like, yes, we have been using mixed materials for a long time, but I remember coming onto the scene like 25 years ago and it was still kind of not, totally acceptable to do it in jewelry. And within like the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years now, more with like uh, the DIYs and Etsy and all those other platforms for the everyday person to be creative, I think it's helped broaden our field much more, um, giving people more access to um, being known in the jewelry community. It's not just about metal and that you can go really big because it won't cost you like a ton of money like it would in silver or gold or even the weight of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Um, Jessica, what are you seeing as far as, you know, current or new trends? You're in Albuquerque, so you have a, a possibly, I could be wrong, but possibly slightly different slant. What are you thinking? You know, I don't know if Albuquerque is the trendiest city on earth. <laughs> It might be on the least trendiest city on earth. Um, we, I, I'm with Amigo. I don't pay attention to trends. Um, you know, and I don't know if it's because I don't want it to influence me or if it's because I don't like it to influence me. I, I hope that my jewelry timeless too. But I do enjoy trends, I suppose. You know, I make big earrings. I'm known for big earrings, like what I'm wearing. Long statement making. Um, and that goes in and out of style. COVID and masking really, uh, you know, big earrings sort of went away. You can't wear them with masks. But can wear them on a Zoom meeting. And so, you know, a couple of months in, I saw a huge dip in sales, especially big earrings. And then starting in probably late November, early December, people started buying big, big earrings from me again, which is really fascinating, right? Um, and are they wearing them on their Zoom meetings or are we saving them for the Great Awakening? that we will have someone. I don't know. Well, great awakening. <laughs> uh, that, that is a, a wonderful thing to think about, isn't it? So- Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, that yeah. It's a fantasy for now, isn't it? <laughs> I, I hear you. I hear you. Well, we're coming uh, uh, up to the last 15 minutes, and um, I would like to really open this up uh, to the audience. Uh, I'm perfectly fine asking many, many more questions, but this is really, you know, an evening for our audience. So uh, Molly is watching the room. If you would like to raise your hand or just say, I have a question in the chat room, we will get to you. And Miko has just said earring sales are definitely up. And I think that must have something to do with, uh, with Zoom meetings, um, for sure. Um, 
Are there any questions in the room, Molly? Yep, so we've got our first question, I believe coming from Karen, if she'd like to lead us off. Yeah. Uh, this has been a very interesting evening, but uh, the only thing I'm missing is seeing more of the work of these artists. And I really would like to see more examples of their work before we part. Okay, so uh, f to the extent that you can just kind of disappear one by one into the back and, uh, you know, and pick some of your works up, that would be, that would be wonderful. Uh, Emiko has already done this. Um, so I'm going to ask um, a next question from Emiko while the is, uh, while she is here, Emiko, um, you know, there, there people are sometimes a little hesitant to wear the work that uh, that you make or that the others make simply because it is considered non-traditional. Um, do you think that is a true statement? Are people still hesitant or have you uh, observed more acceptance lately? I think it depends on the scale, you know, like I have, uh, like, for example, like this is available on uh, the studs and drops. So it's, it looks heavy, but it's really lightweight. And this is pretty indestructible. Um, you mean being plastic, it will scratch, but I think people um, and the bracelets too, you know, more every day. I like to say you could wear this, you know, um, going grocery shopping or just doing your errands, washing the car, you know, cause it's pretty indestructible, but something bigger, like a big neck piece or more one of a kind piece, like from my to be seen, I series people are, you know, it's a little bit bigger. This is also a convertible pin pendant. Um, they might be a little more hesitant, but I always tell them I've constructed them so well that um, you shouldn't be afraid at all to wear them. All right, thank you. Um, uh, Jessica, do you have some more work to share to the camera, please? I do. Um... I'll just start showing you a few things, uh, especially some pieces I know that are on the studs and drops shows. My work is also uh, very light, double-sided, which I think is fascinating, especially for earrings, because you do see all sides of the piece. And most of my earrings aren't symmetrical they don't match there'll be different stones on each side but they're still balanced which I think is really what we're looking for I always tell people they're sisters not twins um let's see who else do I have I also make bracelets uh I I love to make box clasps mostly I love the click that you get from a good box clasp. And see, I've got lots of lovely little stones. Many of them are found um, either just around Albuquerque or I do some stone hunting, stone hounding mm -hmm. here in New Mexico too. Mm -hmm. I, like, I love it that your uh, business name is found in Albuquerque. I think that is very telling and very clever. So Chinanchu, could you please hold up uh, more of your work and then we're moving to John and Corliss. Chinanchu first, please. And you need to unmute yourself if you would, thank you. I'll hold this earring, which is pine needles. We're wrapped with silk yarn. So these are long. I've made longer till here well, like that and it's extremely light and i have a necklace which is india inspired i love colors and combining silk with metal and i have that color combination is amazing thank you I have some organic fiber combined with silk and a combination of it again, light pendant. Yeah, and, and I have another necklace, which is Whoa. light. 
combination again, combining hardware plastics and uh, ropes and textures to it. Thank you. Wonderful. Very beautiful. All right. And Corliss and John, more of your work if you are able to. Yeah. So earlier we were uh, talking, or Cordis was talking about uh, this, this honeycomb material. And this is a combination piece that, uh, there we go, it combines uh, uh, this honeycomb material, which is actually an industrial building material, and uh, polymer clay and the, the uh, uh, neoprene cord, which is this black stuff that's, that's around it. Of course, it's on a uh, silver pierced backing. And uh, this also combines, uh, we're, we're using a powder coating as well. So, you know, you asked about trends and things. We've been doing a lot of work with uh, powder coating and uh, Fordite. I, I decided that I was going to uh, take the plunge and uh, learn how to process uh, that. And uh, that was really born out of uh, carving. And this is a brooch that is actually carved uh, uh, corlite. We, we make the stuff in- How are you? Good, thanks. I'm trying. As uh, well as blocks. And then this is uh, carved and this is a uh, brooch. You know, you asked about uh, do people wear the jewelry? And actually, we find that the people wear the jewelry and then comment back all the time. This is uh, one of the uh, Mojave series. And I don't know if I can get my fingers out of the way here, but uh, this is all Corlite. And it is a brooch. And I'll show you the back. The series was called Mojave Bouquet. And as far as weight comparison is concerned, corlite versus polymer clay, is it the, the same weight? Is one light? Yeah, yeah. Pretty, pretty equivalent. Yeah. Yeah, it's in the same family of materials. So uh, it shares a lot of similarities, working properties, things like that. And then the, the, I'll show you one last example. This is a ring that is uh, made of corlite but we've incorporated a, a, an opal on it and a lot of uh, metal work, traditional metal work. That one is set in a traditional bezel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. By the way, That's... you'll recognize that pattern. There's a pair of earrings in I the uh, arts and crafts of... store that uses that same pattern. Exactly, and very eye-catching photography. Congratulations on that idea. The, the young girl with the wonderful expression on her face, very eye-catching, really great. Okay. Um, more questions in the room. Uh, Molly, do we have yes. anybody else? I'd like to go to Jeffrey next. I saw he had a question and if anybody else would like to wave at me or raise a hand, I'm keeping track. Uh, actually more of just a, a couple of quick statements. Uh, one is, uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it, the New York Times recently did a, a great declarative piece on the brooch is back and uh, and also talking about it for men, which has been something I've considered my pieces unisex. So I was I was fascinated by that. Um, I'm, I, I love this subject of non precious materials. Uh, I had given a couple lectures at some different conferences where I had made almost 200 pieces out of just random ephemeral materials. And for any of you who are artists, it's a wonderful exercise to just get you out of your head and into uh, someplace totally new. But as I did it, I also had concerns uh, because Bruce Pepich from RAM years ago said that when a museum takes on a piece, it's signing on to preserve that piece in perpetuity. So museums have to be careful. Well, we met a, uh, a friend who worked at the Tate Museum and I asked him about this because there seems to be a trend, uh, particularly in art jewelry, but in other fields too, where younger students in school 
are choosing not to be defined by a material or even a discipline. They're increasingly wanting to be chameleons and exploratory in, in nature. And so that means bodies of works are coming out that are not precious materials, that are not necessarily archival materials. And how are the museums responding to that? And his answer was that they have acknowledged that trend, accepted it, and uh, are embracing it. And, and that is not, from his perspective at least, uh, which is anecdotal, but from his perspective, that was not something that would uh, preclude them from seeking uh, pieces that are made of uh, non-archival or non-precious uh, materials. The other thing I love about non-precious materials is that the value of a piece then is solely because of the vision and skill of the artist. Uh, I don't think I've ever made anything that's materially worth more than $5. And so I love that, that it's because of what we as artists imbue it with uh, that adds uh, a perceived value. And, and really value is only a perception anyway. If I can say to speak to Jeffrey's point, it's a great point. As an artist, thinking about how will my work survive in the next 20 plus years, because I've had old pieces um, come back from collectors saying, hey, this is starting to fall apart. And back when I started, I didn't really understand what I was doing with the material until later. So um, advice to anyone working in non-traditional materials, if you're just starting out, really try to think ahead and how how will this hold up or last? Or maybe it won't, and that's the whole point, but something to keep in mind if you think your work might become part of a collection. Now, speaking to Jeffrey's point, uh, we several years ago, we made uh, a pair of earrings out of some found object, well, sort of found objects, uh, alternative materials that we build as the world's most expensive pair of earrings. And <laughs> Uh, what it was was uh, uh, one of our uh, industrial manufacturing friends, uh, uh, they were developing uh, sensors for a CAT scan machine. They invested $25 million into these two microchips. The, the, they were beautiful. They were just silicone uh, rimmed in 24 karat gold, and the entire project was a failure. And so as a gift, he gave me these two sensors that were, were they literally cost them $25 million and they ended up as a pair of earrings. <laughs> Available for purchase. So we'll, we'll let them go for 2.3 million if anybody wants them. Yeah, and the non-fungible tokens, <laughs> uh, uh, which I think is just absolutely- Yeah, we're in a race to see who's gonna get, be the first one of us here to, to do that. I I can't wait, and my money is on you, John Rose. Um, um, so uh, are there any other questions in the room? We're nearing the hour. Uh, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. I think Jolene uh, Castanon, um, uh, Molly is in charge here, so. Yep, whatever. Jolene's up next. Yeah, I just had a question. Um, so it goes to trend setting or following trends. Do you think as makers, that instead of following trends, you follow your inspiration or where exactly do you follow? Because if something has to really pull you to make more, and then it goes to talking about, do you change it to what you think would sell? Uh, so let's, let's just uh, uh, make the round here. I'm gonna start for no reason whatsoever with Jessica. You know, I do consider what is going to sell uh, and what is not to sell for probably about 80% of my interest. But I do play. Um, for instance, I know that giant earrings are not my best sellers. I know necklaces are not my best sellers, but I love to make them, and so I do. And, um, you know, when I was doing shows, I think that giant earrings and elaborate necklaces help sell, you know, the stuff that is at a more expensive price point or a more accessible size or color story. Even. Um, and so you've got to consider all sorts of things when you're the, 
sell stuff and be trying to, you know, follow a trend or try to predict what people are going to buy. Because we are all business people at the end of the day. I do this full time for a living. Um, so that is very important. But I think equally important is some sort of intuition that you can't really describe. I love that you bring up the topic of play. I think it is personally, because I am a metalsmith like many of you, that's my personal background. And I always felt that uh, the act of playing is probably the most important thing that we can do, especially when we're in a rut. And because play is so close to what Emiko is doing, I'm going to move the uh, question on to Emiko, please. You know, I have two different categories of work. I've got the fashion work, you know, like the earrings, the things that are easy to wear every day. And that is somewhat determined by color trends and seasons, uh, as well as scale. But then the bigger work, you know, the things that are more conceptual, you know, is whatever is inspiring me at the moment. Uh, like this is about nonviolent communication, which I'm studying, mindfulness, um, how can we better understand each other and what's going on in the world? So it's more of a time shot of where I'm at at that moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Chinanshu, what are your thoughts? And she needs to unmute herself. So maybe we'll give her a moment. Right. And move. <laughs> are you there? Chin okay, there you go. Okay. So uh, when I was in India and I was running my business, I had to pay salaries to these economically weaker women. And I was going to the shows. And um, when I went to the show, a particular piece style or piece would sell more. I would come back and, you know, I had to make more because, you know, I, it, was, it was being run like a business. But now I, am, <laughs> I, I, I operate as a single artist. And it is about my sustainable, you know, sustaining myself. I, it does the commercial aspect do affect, but yeah, I like to stay true to my style and be experimental. Uh, and you know, at the end of the day, I do it to make myself happy. You know, yeah. and <laughs> I can't be doing what everybody else is doing. You know, what is my uh, input in it? You know, that's the question I keep asking. You know. Wonderful. All right. And uh, Corliss Rose, what are your thoughts on play? <clears throat> um, oh, I am. Okay. I, I thought I was unmuted. Um, with this pandemic, I have allowed myself to play. Um, many times I will concentrate on, okay, there's a show coming up in four months and I need to replenish inventory. What am I going to do that's new? Uh, what am I going to change? Um, what do I think the customers would like? But this period of time uh, has kind of put that aside. And uh, I find that uh, getting into the studio and just starting to work, uh, it almost becomes like automatic writing. You, you get into almost uh, a Zen-like trance zone uh, state and you just create and all of a sudden it's like six o'clock at night and John's asking, what are you gonna make for dinner? So it, in that respect, uh, it's been most enjoyable and it's given me the experience to uh, say, hmm, okay, I'm going to do more of this now because uh, I've, you know, you make some very strong work when you do stuff like that. And uh, with some of these shows coming up, I think some of it might, you know, rub off a little bit. So I've got, uh, I'm sure John would like to add. Yeah, that's, we're very improvisational with how we approach things. Yeah, yeah. So. And in your, in your work specifically, you really ran, I mean, for as long as I've known you, uh, the, the gamut, you know, nothing is safe, you know, with the two rows. Yeah. You see it, you like it, and you make something of it. Uh, uh, that is certainly true. Um, are there any other questions in the room, Molly? Not I haven't seen any. Um, 
Oh, looks like Jeffrey might have one more. I'm going to hold for one second, Jeffrey, just to make sure I'm not missing anybody else, but I don't think I am. So please go ahead, unmute yourself. Just a quick question for uh, all the panelists. Uh, to what extent do you rely on uh, sketching, drafting, pre-planning your piece versus uh, spontaneity and uh, materials speaking to you? Okay, we're gonna do this in the in the in the back, backwards order. So let's start with John Rose. Uh, good question, Jeffrey. The uh, uh, you know because I come from a, a very traditional uh, background training in art, uh, I started uh, uh, living with a sketchbook. I mean, I twenty four seven. I never I went anywhere without it, and in the last uh, ten years we've become, we've sort of gotten away from that and become extremely improvisational. Uh, you know, the, the, the studio is a constant mess because we're selecting and uh, mixing and matching whatever is at hand. And, uh, uh, and that leads to a lot of uh, spontaneous discoveries of textures and colors and, and things. And uh, of course, it also leads to a big box of uh, yeah, we'll get back to that later, you know, stuff. And, you know, I'm sure we all have those. So uh, we, we've, we've sort of been in both places. Although I will tell you, you know, that what uh, uh, one of the things we do is that when we uh, run into those occasional, what do I do next? It's back to the sketchbooks, to the sketchbook, you know, and say, yeah. oh my God, look what I, I was thinking about 10 years ago. And, hey, that's pretty cool. And, you know, we'll, we'll pick up that thread again. So. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, Chinanshu, how about you? Do you sketch? Yes, yes. But uh, if I'm uh, like, um, if I'm playing with a new material which just caught my eye, I do not know the material. I like to play with the material first to understand, you know, is it pliable? Uh, does it break? I mean, I, will it, you know, any new material that I find, I have to play with it for some time to realize how it will turn out to be a jewelry piece, you know. Uh, uh, so there is hours of research. It may end up in a box. I'll deal with you later. Go back to sketching. <laughs> oh, this will work better. <laughs> and then go make it, you know. So first, initially, if I'm working with a new piece, new material, it's a lot of play, a lot of play to understand it. But Sometimes, you know, have to go back to sketchboard and, you know, sketch, 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 and then come back, play with the play piece. So a constant to and fro. Yeah. Jessica, how about you? Do you sketch a lot? I sketch a little bit. Um, sometimes to work out shape or sizing of stuff, I'll sketch. But most of the time, I'm after something else. I'm after a color or um, a combination of colors as opposed to being after a certain look. Um, so sometimes I'll play with colored pencil, but translating the colored pencil story that you get into an enamel story is, um, it's not fun. It's it's more fun to just play with the enamel because it's serendipitous and there's just, there's so little control that you have over it that sketching often goes out the window. Um, and you're left with, with, with what you've made out of the material you're actually working on, which I prefer. Um, metal, enamel, acrylic, sound objects, those are my medium. And sketching is a <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Um, Imiko, how about you? Do you sketch at all? And then uh, uh, I, I'm going to uh, add another question that was just added in the chat room. So number one, do you sketch at all? And then right after that, what inspires you? No, I do not sketch. <laughs> what I do do is use the computer as a, a jump on, jumping off point. So I often will take a, a photograph that's sort of the inspiration for the piece, 
so with the eyes, you know, it was an actual person's eye. Like this is one of my teacher's eyes that I've digitized. So I play around in Photoshop, really minimize it, break it down and use that as a template. And um, I, I'm into making a lot of templates of things. And then because of the nature of Lego, so three-dimensional and all the parts, uh, my sketching is really just opening up all my bins of Lego that are color organized or size organized, and then just playing as if I'm painting with 3D objects. So um, that's how I create a piece. And then I'll often take images along the way so that I can deconstruct the process in case I need to make it again, which has happened a few times. So really documenting is part of my like sketching process by using even just my phone as a tool. Mm -hmm. And then what inspires me, it just depends on whatever phase I'm in. So um, after David Bowie died in 2016, I was on a big David Bowie kick for a few years and it, it still comes in and out, you know, like these earrings are the prettiest star, one of his songs um, series. And, and right now it's nonviolent communication and thinking about um, and racism and especially being as a person of color, you know, how what's really important right now to get out um, in my message is um, made me stop and not be making as much, to be honest, to really be more in my reflective stage. Mm -hmm. All right. What inspires you to roses? Well, you know, it's, I, I've always joked that uh, we've made a career out of ADD. I mean, everything is just, you know, it's coming at us and, and uh, the, the biggest challenge is to, to, to focus that into one thing or another. And so uh, over this last year, you know, we've been doing a lot of uh, political things and uh, just because of the, the times, but um, uh, it just, it's wildly varied. And that's just me, uh, Corliss has her own sensibilities. And well, with, with me, uh, it goes back to my childhood. Uh, I'm the daughter of a florist. My dad had a flower shop and I worked there at a very early age and I was trained to do um, arrangements and corsages and the botanical aspect of work just keeps coming back into the subject matter that I have. Uh, you know, it, and it, um, I never really realized this until I just sat down and thought of, and looked at my body of work and went, oh my goodness, it, it, it's just a repeat of these organic and biological or by um, um, botanical type forms. And it, it goes back to my childhood. So my parents, especially my father, who was my taskmaster and my boss <laughs> at that time had a great influence on me. Mm -hmm. So anybody that needs, if you ever are stumped for the name of a plant or a flower, call us, Corliss can just tell you immediately. I'm pretty good with that, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we, we are, we've, we've went over, over the hour and, uh, you know, if there are any additional questions from the audience, all of these artists are obviously on our website showing their work and there's a way to get in touch with them through their own website or, you know, you can always ask us for their email. We're very happy to forward questions or to just make the connection if that makes anybody's lives easier we're, we'd be thrilled um, to help you out. And um, I just want to say thank you to everyone who showed up, to the artists who gave us of their time, to the audience who gave us of their time. I wish you all artists uh, continued success and many, many sales. And to our wonderful audience, thank you for joining us and asking uh, great uh, questions. We are hosting these type of events fairly regularly. Uh, so uh, we'll send information out online, of course, uh, and you can find it on our website. I wish everybody a lovely evening and uh, it was really great fun having this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Emiko. Bye, Chinanchu. Bye, Jesse. <laughs>